Good morning. <clears throat> My name is Paul Galvani of Ropes and Gray, and I represent the plaintiffs, Senior Housing Properties Trust and HRES1 Properties Trust. May it please the Court, this uh, is an appeal pursuant to Section 118, first paragraph of Chapter 231. My clients, Senior Housing and HRES1, leased two hospitals to the defendant Health South, and they have asserted in complaints filed in the land court that they were defrauded by misrepresentations and by the false financial statements of Health South with respect to that transaction. And therefore, they seek reformation or rescission of the lease and damages for fraud. Uh, in addition, the co-plaintiff, HRPT, filed a bill to try title concerning a parking lot adjacent to a nursing home acquired by Health South from the plaintiffs. Health South has counterclaimed, alleging fraud and various other legal theories. The issue raised by this appeal is whether Health South is entitled to a jury with respect to certain of its claims in light of its abject failure to have complied with the statutory prerequisites for perfecting a jury claim in the land court. To be more precise, the question before the court is whether a judge of the land court has the power to override statutory requirements by exercising discretion reportedly at by exercising discretion, pursuant to Rule 39B of the Massachusetts Rules of Civil Procedure, and in the process to confer jurisdiction on the Superior Court after that court has been divested of jurisdiction by the statute. We submit that the court cannot do that and that therefore the case must be reversed because that is precisely what the land court here did. Chapter 185, Section 15, governs jury trials in the land court. It sets forth the obligatory process necessary to perfect a jury claim in the land court. There are no juries, jury sessions in the land court. It's essentially a little bit like the probate court, which uh, in certain forms of cases, will contests, I think, are one. You have, there's a statute that says you have to frame jury issues. Um, and they do this because these courts have our limited jurisdiction. Correct. And if you frame a jury question, it then is to be transferred to the Superior Court, court for you trial. You have 10 days in which to do it, right? Excuse me? You have 10 days in which to do it. You have 30 days to file a motion to frame the jury. You have 10 days after the last pleading, pleading entering the new, issue, new issues as to which you want to claim a jury. So your argument is really relatively simple. A statute trumps a rule. Well, he said it did. The judge said it did, right? The judge said, I agree with you. The judge, the land court judge, uh, agreed that they had violated the rule, the, uh, the, statute, the, statute, the statute, but nonetheless purported to exercise discretion. And you're right, Your Honor. We say that you can't do that, that the, the statute, in fact, is mandatory, it's obligatory, it's imperative. The word shall is used. It, it does of course, not we do have cases out there that say the civil rules are to have the effect of a statute. Well, but he's not doing it on that basis. He's saying there's going to be a grave injustice here. He right? said it would be a grave injustice, which I have, frankly, have a lot of trouble with. I mean, uh, yeah, isn't that the kind of argument that we often say there may be a grave injustice? Go talk to the legislature. Absolutely, Your Honor. And the legislature has considered this statute and amended this statute. They've never provided, as some statutes do, that the court has discretion to extend the time for filing uh, requests uh, to frame a jury, 
frame jury issues or to file an appeal. The court, the court in this case. Could you could you explain? I mean, I've read their brief and I'm sure they will as well. But but and I, you know, I've just got the judge's characterization that it was his view that there was merit to the defense, to the health south's view that there was something ambiguous about what they should be doing here. Well, what what he's referring to, the the plaintiff health south filed its counterclaims. Thereafter, the plaintiffs filed an amendment to their complaint. Health south then amended its counterclaims. Now, we say that that did not require a further answer because these are really supplemental claims. They did not introduce new theories. But nonetheless, the land court in December of 2004 said to HRPT that my clients replied to that amendment, that set of amended counterclaims. The HRPT did not at that time reply. Judge Long said, well, why don't you file a reply just so the record will be complete? But I'm not going to consider that as a new filing with respect to the provision for filing for framing jury questions. That's what the judge said on December 4th. Yes. And is that your answer to to the defendant's claim that they had until March 26, 05? Beyond that, because it wasn't triggered that the HRPT filed that reply in March of 05. Right. And they filed their request for jury questions in April of 05. But you say that the judge judge specifically said that his extension of time in that regard was not going to extend the time for framing of jury. Correct. But he then made the statement that Chief Justice Marshall referred to about there was some ambiguity, perhaps in their in in the way they construed it. Although he ruled in that decision that, in fact, no new issues had been introduced by the amended counterclaim and therefore a fortiori by the reply. But he said maybe there was some ambiguity and he invoked that in the exercise of his discretion to disregard the statute because he said the statute he was not going to apply the statute. Where in the record do we find the statement of the judges that he was by extending the time for in regard to the counterclaim? He was not there by extending the time for framing of issues. I don't believe that is in the record that was said in court without a transcript. But I don't think there's any dispute about that. Mr. Governor, let me ask you this. I mean, part it seemed to me that what was troubling the land court judge was the following. Your client was on notice that the defendants were going to ask for a jury trial, correct? So this is not a surprise sort of thing. And he says, look, I know there's land at issue here, but this is really a contract dispute. So, I mean, it seemed to me that what he was saying is they may not have technically complied. I mean, in fact, he found they haven't technically complied. But, you know, this is one of those situations where the consequences are such that it's really inconsistent with these are not his words, but sort of inconsistent with what the statute is really trying to do. And I take it your answer is he doesn't have that discretion. That's correct, Your Honor. And in fact, I would submit, I mean, we and HRPT went to the land court because we sought the expertise of the land court. In fact, the complaint of HRP to try title is within the exclusive jurisdiction of the land court and cannot be transferred pursuant to the very same statute that governs the motion to frame jury questions. Chapter 118, Section 15, the second paragraph. But I would also add that the judge, in fact, I would submit, did not actually exercise discretion because he said, I'm never going to do this again. He first said this is a longstanding procedure in the land court and it's routinely followed in the land court. And then he said, but then he went on to, in fact, exercise discretion here. But he added a footnote to his opinion 
saying, Excellent. I don't want anybody to misunderstand me here. Uh, in the future, I will, in fact, uh, enforce this statute strictly. Well, it seems to me that's the antithesis of the exercise of discretion. Well, I think what he's, I mean, again, and, and I, you know, I'm sure that uh, Health South will, will, will point out, what the judge seems to be saying, as I read it, was, look, I may have caused this problem. I issued a ruling. I may have caused the problem. I, I know the ruling on its face says what it says, but, you know, I may have caused it, so I'm just telling everybody, in, in essence, I'm taking this upon myself. I mean, that's, am I, am I misleading what the judge well, said? I, I that, that I'm may not, be I'm that not, may be I'm the not sympathetic. Sure that he's allowed to do that. But. Well, that may be the sympathetic uh, emotion he was feeling. But in fact, they should have filed <laughs> their motion of frame jury issues long, long before, because right. the amended, yeah. even the amended complaint didn't add any new issues. The issues were teed up early on. The issues that they're claiming a jury are their issues. They knew what the ever they know what the <laughs> claims are. They could have framed Is jury questions. Is there any question. question that these are compulsory counterclaims? So Is there any question that these are compulsory counterclaims? Um, no, I, I don't think that was considered, but I think these, they are compulsory. I think they're compulsory right? They're compulsory so, so they, they arise from the same matrix yeah, yeah, yeah. effect. The other, the only other point quickly is the jurisdictional one, because the statute says if you haven't complied with the statute, the superior court shall have no further jurisdiction. Right. And I would submit that certainly in the exercise of discretion, the land court can't confer jurisdiction under the superior court. Right. Thank you, Mr. Galvani. Do I have Mr. Brown? Yeah. Thank you, Your Honor. My name is Phil Brown, and I am here on behalf of HRPT Properties Trust. And just to pick up on uh, Chief Justice Marshall's last comment, uh, whether or not the judge was sort of taking one for the team, I think you can look No, I at wasn't saying that. What I was saying is the judge is looking at his record saying, I thought I, thought I was clear. Apparently, I wasn't clear. You know, the, these, claimed, these defendants have claimed the right to a jury from the get-go, correct? As did I HRPT. And the point is, Your Honor, that people that come into the land court understand what has to be done under 185, Section 15, to preserve that jury right. HRPT also, in its initial complaint, made a demand for a jury trial. It ultimately decided not to have it. Decided not to have so it. So you're saying I should essentially, we should, the, the court should essentially, in other words, you may be, you know, protecting your options, but <coughs> you've got to go through the steps. That's correct, Your Honor, and there are strategy decisions that can be made uh, based upon a party's decision to waive a jury trial. E even if um, a, uh, the clock started to run under the statute, uh, when HRPT filed its answer to the counterclaim on March 16th of 05. There, the defendants filed a motion to frame the jury issues on April 12th. You still have to get the decision on the motion to frame the issues and file that with the Superior Court, don't you? That's correct, Your Honor. That's what the statute says. N now, w is there any indication in this record that that could not possibly have been done within the 30-day period? Well, I think that it, it could have been done. All that needs to be done is to set up a hearing, and the land court has traditionally been very flexible in getting hearings, and they understand that this process has to be done quickly, and you can get the, the, uh, the jury issues over to the Superior Court. Alternatively, if the land court... So it could have been done within three days, you said. It could have been, Your Honor. Uh, or alternatively, uh, if the land court hasn't acted on that, I suppose as the person seeking the jury trial, you could take the jury issues that you have framed and file them in the Superior Court. And I, and I would submit, Your Honor, that if you as the applicant have taken those steps and you've done everything that you could do, uh, I'm not sure that if the land court has failed to act on that, that in fact there would be, in that case, a waiver. Well, it, now, the statute um, refers to, makes reference to the rules of civil procedure. And where, this, where the rules of civil procedure have a discretionary uh, forgiveness power, why shouldn't that discretionary power 
control when the 30 days period under the statute starts to run? Because the case law is pretty clear that the rules of civil procedure cannot trump what's said. But they're not trumping it. The statute says that the 30 day period starts to run when the last claim of jury trial is filed. And you have 30 days after that has occurred. Under the rules of civil procedure, that can happen almost any time. Well, but under the rules of civil procedure, once you've, what I think the rules of civil procedure are referring to is you, under the rules, you make your jury demand. If, in fact, you fail to make a jury demand, then Rule 39 gives the court discretion, and it's a pretty wide discretion, as to allowing you to submit your jury demand. In this case, I think it's a little bit different because you have the mandatory shall language in the statute, which requires the person seeking a jury trial to take certain steps. That wasn't done here. And where you have that shall language, that, in fact, trumps over what the rules say. And you also have the added impact of Rule 82, which says that the rules of civil procedure can't confer jurisdiction. Here, Health South, by not taking advantage of what it was supposed to do to get the jury trial, the Superior Court has no jurisdiction. So that really is where the discretion goes away. It's when the legislature inserted the word jurisdiction, they really were contemplating a fixed period of time, so that if the claim for jury trial were not filed, even under the rules, within the certain period of time, then the Superior Court lost jurisdiction, regardless of what the rules of civil procedure say. Absolutely, Your Honor. Can I ask you a question, Mr. Brown? There was a motion to frame the jury issues filed in this case in April. Were the jury issues as framed in that motion different than they would have been before the amended counterclaim and the final answer, so to speak? I don't think so, Your Honor, because the interesting thing about this case is that the counterclaims that have been asserted time and again are really no different than the Rule 24 complaint that was filed back in 2003. And so the framing of the jury issues, we, from our point of view, are really the same as the jury issues as they would have been framed from the Rule 24 complaint. And in fact, the amendments that were added in November of 2004 were really three or four of the paragraphs had nothing to do with HRPT. They dealt with some contractual agreements between senior residential care and Health South. And then the last one, the paragraph 27, simply dealt with a catch-all, we fraudulently, we engaged in a fraudulent conduct, which is the same allegation that was made in the Rule 24 complaint. Mr. Brown, before you sit down, and I had intended to ask Mr. Galvani, but I'll ask you and then I'll also ask Mr. Greenberg. There's another piece of the judge's order that I found interesting. Essentially, as I understand your position, this is jurisdictional. What the judge seems to have done is to say, well, you have a right to a jury trial. I can't give you a jury trial. I've got to transfer it over to the Superior Court at some time. But I'm the judge assigned to this. I'm going to do all the pre-trial things beforehand, whatever that means. I take it that means discovery, summary judgment, motions to dismiss, motion to clarify, motions to amend. And then when I've decided that everything's now ready to go to the jury, I'm going to send this across to the Superior Court. Am I reading his order correctly? I think that's somewhat what he contemplated. But the fact is that with respect to at least the tri-title claim, he can't send that over. I mean, what I'm saying is, has this happened before? I mean, either you have a jury claim, in which case it's over in the Superior Court. The Superior Court is perfectly capable. It has the same time standards. It runs jury claims all the time. It has discovery. I mean, was somebody asking, I want a jury in the Superior Court, but I want you to deal with everything here? Isn't this a... Well, I actually... This is like a push-me-pull-you. I mean, it struck me as a push-me-pull-you. I guess from a practical standpoint, Your Honor, I took that language to say that 
I'm here. I'm familiar with this case so far. I think that I can handle the pretrial proceedings. I can't do a jury trial, but I can do all the other things uh, up to perhaps the pretrial conference. And then we can send over the jury issues or send over the case. He was sending over the entire case to the Superior Court for uh, uh, decision. I think the way it's contemplated is that you can send over certain issues if the jury has been requested, and then that has to come back for the final entry of judgment and for the final... I understand, but I find that an interesting order if, the, if, the, if, uh, if I accept your argument that <coughs> this is jurisdictional. The jury's claim has been established with respect to those issues, those are in the Superior Court. If it's jurisdictional, how come the land court is doing, I mean, I understand there may be, the, the, the statute may make it a little bit more difficult. Well, I'm not sure that the land court loses its jurisdiction because its jurisdiction with respect to certain of the claims is concurrent with the superior court. So I'm not sure that, that, uh, that the, the land court would actually lose jurisdiction when it transfers. Uh, why, don't we, why don't we just have the CGM designate the land court judge as a superior court judge? Bring the jury down from the courthouse here down to wherever they are now, over near Boston Garden, someplace, whatever the hell it's called, and uh, do it that way. Well, Your Honor, I, I think because they not can't jurisdiction. do that because they've already lost the jurisdiction. They, the time periods have expired, and so he's already mm -hmm. lost the ability. Put it this way: to if, if we agree with Mr. Greenberg and, and uh, Health South, then what Justice Greenier's suggestion suggesting would make eminent yes. sense. But if we agree with you, then it wouldn't. Otherwise, I take it your argument would be you can forget about the statute. If you file in the land court and there's a jury claim, just get the... Can they, can they withdraw, just voluntarily dismiss some of their pleadings and then refile them? There's no statute of limitations problem because they've been timely filed in the first place and that would start the clock running all over again, wouldn't it? I suppose that that's one <coughs> way out of this. Uh, well, that's they, why I asked Mr. Galvani. Why didn't anybody think of that before? But I think the problem is that we wanted that the East Hill South wanted to keep the cases together. Well, that's why I asked Mr. Galvani whether they compulsory counterclaims. If they're compulsory, I think they didn't really have any alternative but to assert them here. Mm -hmm. yeah, but I don't think they could have separately but, filed in this. Yeah. Maybe they could have. Well, no, but the timing the timing could be affected because they're compulsory and they could just withdraw them and re, re, refile them. And the clock starts running all over again. I don't think there are any statute of limitations issues, Your Honor. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Mr. Greenberg. Thank you. Good morning, Your Honor. My name is Gary Greenberg, and with me is Jonathan Cohen. Um, from our perspective, Your Honor, the question is very, very simple. The simple issue is whether or not Rule 39B applies to the land court. If it applies... Well, well it doesn't, does it? I'm sorry, It Your does Honor. not, does it? Well, Your, Your Honor, uh, with all due respect, uh, as we, we submit, we believe that it does. That, in fact, and, and clearly the land court judge believed that he had the right under Rule 39B to allow a uh, what he viewed to be a late request uh, for a jury demand. We don't believe, Your Honor, that there's any inconsistency, there's no irreconcilable conflict between the statute, if you look at the statute and you look at Rule 39B. Can, can, Mr. Greenberg, why do, I, why, do I have to, why do I have to reach the conclusion, and maybe I do, that Rule 39B doesn't apply to the land court as opposed to it applies to the land court in the absence of a statute that says precisely the contrary. Your Honor, the statute, we believe that a fair reading of the statute is consistent with Rule 39B. Well, that's, that's that, that, there's no, that there is no irreconcilable conflict. The, the statute, as Your Honor is, is familiar, when the court, right. the court in a number of other rules, particular 39D, makes it very clear that Rule 39D doesn't apply to the doesn't apply to the district court. There are other instances throughout the rules where the rules of civil procedure specifically say that this particular rule is being modified as it pertains to a particular court in this particular rule. That 
if in the adoption of the rules of civil procedure it was intended that Rule 39B not apply to the land court, it would state as it does in 39D as it pertains to the district court. But the second point, which I believe Well, no, because you could have Rule 39B, which those are the rules of civil procedure. The land court has civil proceedings. There may or may not be a statute in existence. In other words, there has to be a statute at the moment. There might not be a statute next time. Now, the framers of the rule, I mean, classically, when you've got what appears to be a conflict, you say there's no conflict. But I'm just saying I don't have to have anything in the rules of civil procedure that say 39B is not applicable. All I have to look to see is whether it's inconsistent with the statute. But, Your Honor, the statute says under Rule – Section 15 of Chapter 185, it says, and I believe you can harmonize it, it says that in action of government – I'm sorry. Which section? It's Chapter 185, Section 15. Yeah. I'm sorry. It talks about a jury demand being made in accordance with the rules, the rules of civil procedure. Now, you can, with all due respect, you can, as the land court found, you can make a – you can get a jury two different ways. One is you make a demand under Rule 38, and the other is you ask the court for a demand under Rule 39B. And just so it's clear, it's our position, and if you look at – you know, this is a 100-year-old statute, okay, long before rules of – you know, modern rules of discovery. Okay. If you – and I think this addresses the point Chief Justice Marshall was raising in terms of real life, real practicalities. What the land court judge did was – it's implicit. He found that he had – that Rule 39B allowed him – applied to him, allowed him to allow a late-filed jury demand. And I think that a fair reading of the statute, as I said, the statute talks about making a demand in accordance with the rules. Their argument says the only way you can get a jury is if you make a demand under 30 – under Rule 38. That isn't the only way you can get a jury under the rules. You can get a jury under 39 – under 39B. And therefore, it would be our position that at any point in time, a land court judge, prior to the, you know, commencement of trial, could allow a party to make a demand for a jury. If you look at this case, in addressing a couple of questions that was raised before, as Your Honor has pointed out, in every – this was a compulsory counterclaim. And given the litigation history of the parties, that if we had chosen to file a separate independent action, it's no doubt we would have been filed – been faced with a motion to dismiss. But how does your – how does your take on the case square with what Mr. Galvani said, if you agree with that? He said that the judge said that he wasn't extending the time for framing jury issues when he said he was extending the time for the counterclaim. Did the judge say that? Do you agree? Your Honor, I wasn't at the hearing, but my understanding is that what he was saying is that I'm – to file a reply, that it's not going to have any – it's not going to have any impact on my decision as to whether or not Rule 185, Section 15 precludes the – But why would he say that if what you're saying is true? I thought you're saying – maybe I'm misunderstanding you, but you're saying that you don't have to follow the statute. The rule gives them – gives you time anyway. Your Honor, what I'm saying is that what the judge found was that we didn't – we didn't follow one way to get a jury trial. Okay? But that isn't the end of the story. The end of the – because there's an alternative, and the alternative is under 39B. But, Mr. Greenberg, my problem with the way you're framing it, and maybe I'm just having problems with the way you're framing it, is to say that essentially, because he happened to, you know, to find that there would be a grave injustice here, but discretion – you know, we have rules, for example, that say, you know, your first pleading, the civil – you know, you proceed at your risk in the superior court. If you – in the superior court, if you don't claim – if you don't go and screaming and shouting for a jury trial right off the get-go, right? Everybody knows. You've got to go and you've got to put it in the first or whatever you do, and motion to dismiss, and, you know, half the bar out there says motion to dismiss P.S. If you don't dismiss the motion, I'm going to file – you know, demand a jury trial. I mean, you know, that's – that's common practice. If I – if I accept your argument, essentially says the legislature has a statute. 
land court judges can just disregard the statute. They can just disregard the statute. They can go in under Rule 39B and give a jury trial whenever they want to give a jury trial. Your Honor, that's not what I'm, what I'm saying is that there's a 100-year-old statute that was modified by the rules. The rule, the, I'm the, not the, sure that the <laughs> rules can modify a statute. But, but, Your Honor, the, the addition to the statute was you make a demand in, you make a demand in accordance with the rules. And the rules provide two ways in which you can make a demand. I, just in the context that we're dealing, I want, we're dealing with a statute that was, that was enacted in the late 1960s. I understand, Mr. Greenberg, and quite often, I really do understand, and I think this judge was trying to make sense of this, but quite often, more times than I care to think, we will look at counsel and say that's a very powerful policy argument. Go tell the legislature to change the statute. Well, what tells me that I've got an explicit statute and then the court can issue a rule that essentially says you can ignore the statute? Again, again, I believe the statute. Can I do that? And then on top of it, he says he's never going to do it again. I read that footnote as being that this is not an invitation to. But if you've got discretion, you've got discretion. How can you wholesale eliminate your power of discretion? I know I didn't read the footnote as saying that I'm never going to exercise my discretion. It was rather this is not as this is not to be used as precedent in future cases. Let me just explore one of the other possible trees here. And that is that you never got an answer to your counterclaim from HRPT until March 16th of 2005. Now, you never defaulted them for for I mean, I suppose no good deed goes unpunished, but you never defaulted them. So they still were allowed to answer the counterclaim, although it was in an amended form. And they answered on March 16th of 2005. We filed a motion April 12th. OK. And the judge hadn't issued his ruling. You may recall he didn't issue his ultimate decision until I think it was June of 05. So this this we had been briefing the issue that he had raised in December of 04. They filed their report, their reply. We filed the motion. But the matter is still this issue of the in terms of whether the judge is going to allow a jury trial to go forward is still. I mean, why would their answer make any difference? Well, you're on the pleadings hadn't been closed. I mean, if you want to look at a very technical issue, the pleadings had not been closed until middle of March. And under Rule 38, you have until you have a right to to frame your jury issues when the last claim of jury trial comes in. They never answered your counterclaim. Your Honor, we argued that we made a timely motion to frame jury issues under either. And we also alternatively in our papers before the before the land court, we are alternatively under Rule 39 B. Did you ask for a hearing on your motion to frame the jury issues? I don't. What happened was he had this matter under advisement, the entire issue. So I can't give it. I don't know. All right. Boy, Charles Dickens would have a field day with this. Did you ever think of withdrawing your claims and refiling them and starting the clock running all over again? Your Honor, we would think we would consider anything. It was our goal to have all of the litigation. And there is other between these two parties in one single proceeding, especially since they was. Do you think you can do that? You get a designation of a judge. I mean, can you can you do I mean, can you if you have a I mean, I'm just interested if you have a compulsive counterclaim. We didn't think we could. The reality is we could because they had sued under a contract and we had counterclaims under that contract. So you can't then dismiss them and then bring something else. And it's been difficult to stipulate to very much. All right. So that's off the board. If you have more time, you can elucidate any. It's fine, Mr. Dickens. The problem is clear. The answer is no. No, Mr. Galvani, you may not have Mr. Greenberg's time. Thank you, counsel. We'll take a short break. Thank you.